Now, a few weeks back, we interviewed George Hotz on this program. He's the now famous hacker who's embroiled in a legal battle with Sony for jailbreaking the PlayStation 3 and then publishing the encryption key and software tools on his website for anyone out there to access. Now, whatever you think of Hotz and his hacking, this next update on the case you should pay attention to. A federal magistrate has granted Sony the right to acquire the IP addresses of anybody who's visited Hotz's website from January 2009 to the present. So did you get that? That means anybody out there who accessed this site, whether they used his encryption key or not, are now going to have their IP addresses, other personal information, given over to Sony. I'd say that that's a privacy issue. Here to discuss it with me is Ryan Raddy, Associate Director of Technology Studies at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Ryan, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, what do you say? Do you think that this is a troubling ruling? I mean, you know, I, as a journalist, for one, look at this in a very troubling way because that means that if I was doing research, if I was out there looking at George Hotz's website before I wanted to interview him, my IP address is now going to be handed over. And what about anyone who's just generally curious? Now that's been criminalized as well? It looks, based on the decision issued by the judge, that there is a risk that anonymity, which is a very important value that courts have long recognized to be protected by the First Amendment, may bump bu heads increasingly in the digital age in the case of lawsuits, such as, in this case, a copyright infringement lawsuit. So you think that it's a danger to our privacy? It is a danger to our privacy when judges are issuing these subpoenas that involve identifiable user information. We're talking about things like your IP address or even your username, both of which can be fairly easily tied back to you in many cases. The frustration here is that the judge didn't take seriously the argument advanced by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which filed a brief in the case. They argued that because the only real reason for the court to need these IP addresses was to establish jurisdiction, that the subpoena, the court order here, was just too broad, that a narrower subpoena focusing on non-identifiable information would have been more appropriate. And I think that's what the court should have done. And have there, weren't there other subpoenas issued also, uh, in, in this case of George Hotz, it wasn't just anybody who visited his website, but also his Twitter information, YouTube, Google also were given subpoenas? Correct. YouTube, Google, Twitter, and a couple of other services all received court orders looking for information. Now, when we're talking about this guy's information being handed over by, for example, Twitter, I think it's fair for there to be a court order. George Hotz... While I think what he did probably shouldn't be illegal, may well have violated the 1998 Digital Millennium Copyright Act. He may be liable to, for, to Sony. So I understand why they're seeking these records. The fear here is when you start to go beyond just what he sent and what people sent to him, but also who was looking at his videos, who was commenting on his blog. That's where the troubling aspect of privacy and free speech come into play. Now, what is Sony saying here as to why they need the information of anybody who looked at his blog? They're saying that it's a matter of jurisdiction? That's one of two reasons. The, their argument on jurisdiction is that the case should be heard by court, a federal court in Northern California, whereas George Hotz wants it to be heard in New Jersey. Now, the reason why Sony thinks Northern California is better is because that court has long been friendlier in copyright infringement cases like this one, whereas George Hotz is based in New Jersey. That's where he lives, so he wants it to be heard there. The reason why Sony wants these IP addresses is so it can demonstrate to a judge that folks who were accessing this allegedly illegal content were physically located in Northern California. The second reason they want it is because they want to figure out if George Hotz violated a temporary restraining order that a court issued back in January of this year. They're trying to find out whether, even after he was ordered to stop distributing the uh, go the how-to video on PS3 jailbreaking, whether or not he was still doing it. But to, to figure that out, you don't need identifying information. You could do that. You could get access to that information with a far less revealing subpoena. Yeah, it sounds like this is about George Hotz, not every single person that visited his site. But, you know, you mentioned uh, whether we're not sure whether what he did is really wrong or not. I mean, George Hotz has now become famous because he was the first person to successfully jailbreak an iPhone. And that now, by the courts, has been proven to be legal. So what makes it so different when you're jailbreaking a video game console? Under this law that I mentioned in 98, generally speaking, unless there's a sp special decision otherwise by the Copyright Office, any device designed to circumvent copy protection is unlawful. The thing with George Hotz in his case is that he wasn't trying to 
facilitate piracy. He wasn't trying to make it easy for people to run pirated software. He just wanted to run homebrew software, things like the Linux operating system, on a Sony PS3 that he had lawfully purchased. Now, I don't think that should be a crime. If he's infringing on their rights, if he's somehow stopping publishers from making money, that's one thing. But so far, to my knowledge, Sony hasn't brought any evidence that he was doing something with the intent of violating their copyrights, which is why I think he shouldn't be uh, uh, found liable for any charges. It's also why I think Congress should revisit this law and ensure that folks who are just trying to reverse engineer their own devices aren't going to be liable under these copyright suits for potentially huge damages. Now, he was, you know, we interviewed him uh, a couple weeks ago here on the program, and he was telling me that his encryption code, and this is where you're going to have to help me out because it goes above my head, also didn't allow for people to use uh, pirated you know, games or whatever on their PS3 because that's not something that he believes in. So does Sony actually have any proof that someone did go ahead and do that? Well, we do know that people are using the information that he acquired and the tools that he discovered to pirate games. Now, others have been involved in this. In general, when piracy on a device is discovered, it's the process of a work by a lot of different folks. So it wasn't just George Hotz. He built on the work of others. Others built on his work. There's no doubt that what he did was very instrumental in this process. But if people are pirating games, that's not his fault. Unless he's selling this software to people with the intent of making it so they can pirate, which he isn't, as far as I know. He's not the one breaking the law. Sony wants to go after the people who are using this for pirating games. That's one thing. If Sony wants to go after the people who are uploading pirated games to BitTorrent, that's also, I think, a, a legitimate case. But going after these hackers who are just trying to run their own devices is something that should not be illegal and it shouldn't be the basis for civil action. Well, it does sound like he started quite a, a chain of events in Sony here. I, you know, I mean, they've also made statements like they want to take the encryption code off the Internet entirely and wipe it clean, which, I'm sorry, Sony, you just can't do that. That's not how the Internet works. So I think they're being a little uh, overreaching here. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.